Good morning, everyone. This is Mario Hardy, a.k.a. DJ Ragtop, and this is Tish. Go ahead, Tish. Hello. Good morning. This is Tisha Joyner. And today we're going to kind of like a part two for what we had discussed last week. Um, well, what was it like that last week, week before last? Yeah. And, um, pretty much we had a lot of people who asked a lot of questions in reference to um, planning and some of the things on the cost and I guess how to save money and things of that nature. So we had a lot of different questions and we're going to try to cover that during this show. Um, one of the first things I want to start off with is everyone knows this is the first month of the year. And Tish, Tish, what do you think? Um, isn't this probably the primary month where a lot of people start to put things in place for for weddings and things that are taking place for the rest of the year? Would you it agree is. with that? It is. I would agree. Um, a lot of times, um, because it's right after the holidays of Thanksgiving and Christmas, we start getting a bunch of phone calls during the month of January. And then the only other time that's a super increase is right after Valentine's. Because technically Valentine's is the month where, or I should say the day where everybody proposes to everybody. Because think about it, proposals normally happen during Christmas time, during the holidays. Mm -hmm. And the big day, of course, is Valentine's Day. So um, those are real, real big days that a lot of people get like proposed to. And so then come the month of January, I would say January, February, March, April is when we get the most requests for services. That's correct. So um, we're going to cover some of the details. And then, like, uh, one of the things I did want to cover on this one was wedding expos. Um, mm -hmm. Is a wedding expo, do you think it's a good good thing to attend? If if we have brides and grooms that are preparing themselves for upcoming weddings, is it good for them to go to expos if they haven't hired their vendors or venues yet? Um, I think it could be. I think that if the bride and groom are doing some homework prior to the um prior to the expo, like um the vendor that you're looking for, if it's a photographer, at least have good five good questions for the photographers that you might see there. Um, if it's a cake designer, have at least five good questions. You know what I'm saying? Do a little bit of research before you go. Um, if you don't have a chance to do that when you go there, make sure you ask questions. Um, and don't just go with the first person that you meet go through the entire expo and meet everybody, take their cards, get their information, um, make little notes on what you discuss with each one of them. So when you come back to those notes, you can say, okay, well, this particular one, planner A, I like their so-and-so, so-and-so, designer C, I like their so-and-so, so-and-so. It's just better for you if you do a little bit of research and spend some time um, just exploring all the options. And it's really, really good for people who've never, ever even thought about a wedding and don't have an idea or a clue of where to start, wedding expos can give you access to so many different types of vendors that you can actually kind of get a order of what you want or what you, what you want to prioritize, be it the venue, your catering, your planner, your decor. You can kind of start working on that after you go through the, or as you're going through the expo. So they, I think they can be very, mm, what's the word I'm looking for? They can be very educational if you utilize it the right way. Right. And I think that's one of the things that, cause I know I saw that they're, they have this big expo coming up in Raleigh mm -hmm. and sometimes it's good to go to those. If you have no clue or no background or what you're looking for or your vision, mm -hmm. I think expos are really good to go to or attend because then they actually get a chance to, um, like I said, test the waters mm -hmm. before they start calling and hiring and putting down deposits and everything. Yes. So that's the so the next question I guess is when it comes time to hire, I think I asked this question um during the week. What's the first thing that you would recommend a customer lock in first before they do anything else? The venue. You need to know, okay. You need to know where you're having this, and it needs to be based on a couple of different things. The theme of your event. Um, and I don't mean something like necessarily doesn't have to be something as severe as a beauty and the beast theme. Like that's a theme, but I mean, like theme is in like, um, do you want something that's like hearted? Do you want something that's, um, a big family style, something like think about how you want things set up for your reception and for your ceremony. And then once you kind of think about that and you start thinking about the number of people that you're wanting to invite or expect to have attend, 
then you need to look, start looking at your venues to sit, figure out what's too big, what's going to be too small. Those are, you know, those types of things first. After you get your, and I would say, look at five or more venues. Look around. Look them, look them up on the internet. Um, research them. Look at their websites. They usually have a lot of pictures posted. Go through those pictures. Um, take a look at what their work, what their stuff looks like when it's all dressed up and when it's not so dolled up. So to see if it'll fit with what you want to see when you walk in your room. And then also just to add to that, you definitely want to read the reviews mm -hmm. um, because a lot of reviews, if it's it's a difference to where if you have one or two negative reviews versus mm -hmm. if you have over over twenty negative reviews, mm -hmm. um, most of the time if you see the same review over and over again then most likely that means that venue has an issue or um, with that, with something like if there's something like the e AC or the heat is not working properly. Oh yeah. That quite a few times um, that can make or break an event because God knows if it's too hot or too cold, it makes it very uncomfortable for the guests to stay. And they most mm -hmm. likely won't stay long That's correct. because they won't enjoy themselves. That is <clears throat> So what, so, Tish, what type of thing should a person take into consideration um, when they're looking for a planner? Like, um, I noticed that there is a different, there's a different level of pricing when it comes, just like how it is for DJs. Mm -hmm. You know, every DJ price is different. So, when it comes to planners, what, what, like, of course, it's almost the same thing when it comes to DJs. But what makes the prices so different? First, it'll be the, the type of services, the amount of services that you're supplying. You can hire someone, what I call um, day of event coordination or management. Some people may say a, a day of coordinator. Um, that, that usually is somebody you get that comes in the day of to make sure that everything runs smoothly. That's one price bracket or, or price range. And then you've got a partial planner, someone that comes in and does some of the work with you um does uh maybe about half of the work with you along the way maybe you've already done some of the work yourself so they come and help you with the rest of the work then that's another price bracket and then you've got a full service you know event planner which means that person is holding your hand from beginning to end so they're helping you get your venue helping you set up your venue tours or helping you meet with your potential vendors um taste testings for your sweet treats for your cake for your food um they're doing their hands on with some of everything that's going on with the entire wedding so their price break because their amount of time um committed time to you and your event is much higher their prices are going to be much higher for full service right and i think like the full service planner normally what happens is is you give them the budget and then they go out and do everything for you all you do is show up technically for the technically. way and those then technically that's that type of service is a little bit more expensive than all mm -hmm. the rest so when you do it a partial is. planning partial planning services then that's where you still do some of the work like you go out and find your own vendors your own venue and then they kind of like um are the communication piece between between the customer and the vendors mm -hmm. so and then the day of, I mean, that's that. I think that's what it is. All pretty much all of the above will relieve stress. Yes. Um, the day of the event, it will relieve a big amount of stress. But like I said, most of the time, in order for it to work, the customer has to have a clear vision of what they want. If you can't, it's just like uh, if you can't communicate to your planner um, the vision that you want for your wedding day. It makes it extremely difficult for that those individuals to come together and lay out your your vision. That's correct. So but then you also, I ran into. Go, go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Some something I ran into very recently was um, I had a uh, client who had been working with a designer, um, planner slash designer, who basically was not listening to anything this client was asking her for. And basically that planner slash designer was terminated. The contract was terminated because she wasn't getting the, the person that she tried to hire was not going with what the plant, the actual bride wanted for her event. That can be a problem as well. So you got to make sure there's great communication between the planner and the clients and great, you know, they, they can talk back and forth and they can 
um, and I hate to say it like this, but it's almost like a vibe that needs to exist between the two of them to make sure that things run smoothly. Um, if you don't have that, sometimes things can go left very quickly. Right. And I think that's one of the biggest pieces that you have to, like I said, you have to have that strong communication. There can't mm -hmm. be any barriers in place. And most of the time what happens is some, and again, <clears throat> this is not all, but this is some are the ones that are developing their, their, they're just getting started, they're developing, and they're limited on what they have or what they can do. So what they try to do is, is trying to mm -hmm. get the customer to shape their vision into what they can do, and that's what causes mm -hmm. most of the problems. A lot so of that's one of those things where, um, I mean, that's why, I mean, I know as, as just as a DJ, I know I spend a lot, so much time understanding the vision of the customer because um, God knows if I do do something that goes against that vision, it causes more stress towards that couple and it kind of irritates them because now what they're looking for is not going to come close to it. That's correct. Very true. So what happens um, when, is it good to move forward with a customer where if you just cannot meet their needs? I would say no. I would say no. So um, I, I just, I, um, if, if, if someone wants, I'm trying to think of something I don't know how to do. Um, uh, if someone, well, I know how to do this, but I'm just going to say, what if I didn't know how to do it? Um, so ceiling draping. If a customer came to a, a designer or a planner and said, hey, I want to get ceiling draping. If it's a planner who does not do design work, then of course that planner can hire someone to come in to do that work. Right. But if it's a planner slash designer decorator and they say they can do all these things, but yet you want ceiling draping um, and they can't provide it or you can't provide it as a, you know, as a vendor, I honestly would tell the person that's not something I do. Um, I would say I, I can either direct you to someone who does that very specific item or I can hire someone in to you know, to do that, it would be a separate service or something like that. But I, I personally wouldn't want to take on that type of job that I don't know how to do. Does and that's that I mean, I'm, glad, yeah, I'm glad you said that because I, I want some people to understand <clears throat> there is a big difference from a wedding coordinator planner that mm -hmm. has the skill set of a decorator mm -hmm. versus a wedding planner coordinator. And that's all their job is, is just mm -hmm. to do that. And the, what, what's going on in the industry, and this is one of the things, again, is, I think it's across the board for all elements of the industry, is there's a big difference. Um, and you have to understand that big difference because not every coordinator can decorate. That's correct. Not every planner person. can do it. And again, not every decorator can coordinate. <clears throat> so it's kind of like one of those things to where, it, don't get me wrong, it's a plus if you're able to find someone who's who can do planning and decorations together, because to keep in mind, the price is not really going to change a lot, but it's just that you're dealing with one element versus two separate elements. And so a lot of people think that if they hire, hire somebody that can do both, they're saving money. But in reality, you're not it's saving still money. About the same amount of money, to be honest, right? Because you have to look at them as two, two separate services. Um, planning your party or wedding, we're going to focus on weddings, like, um, of course, but me planning your wedding is a cost. Um, me designing and decorating your, your wedding is a cost. Those are two separate things. They're not actually merged into one. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, because I have two separate companies that do two separate things. Right. You know, you know what I mean? So eight mm -hmm. lilies does what it does. Young and lovely does what it does hire both of you choose to but i i leave that as an open option for clients because i don't want if you don't want let's say you have um a cousin who does like me and you we have um you have a cousin that does decorating as well right right so mm -hmm. if you if you wanted to do something you could hire me to do one part you can hire her to do the other part you see what i'm saying right that right. that would be the option and because i want that to be an option with clients i don't i want them to feel like they're being forced because some and I'm a sidebar for a second because sometimes these venues and their rules and who they're telling they can bring in, who they can't bring in are getting outrageous. 
That's my sidebar moment. Yeah. Okay. We'll that, talk about that later. We're gonna talk about that. Yeah, we're gonna talk about that because that's gonna go. That's gonna. So that's I, gonna and I don't like to try to regulate folks' money like that. Right. I feel like if you're gonna spend it with me, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. I'm okay with that. Because but like, you gotta remember that those are two separate services at all right. times. And I think that's what people have to understand is that when when you're going out and you're looking for, uh, and like, and this is one of the things I'm starting to. There's a there's a pattern now, is there, a lot of people think that the most common thing is the wedding planner coordinator is supposed to be the decorator and mm. that's not the case but even though that's a major trend that's going on in our area um mm. that doesn't mean it's the standard and no. so I, I let people understand that when you hire an actual wedding planner coordinator um people need to understand there is a there's certain things you can define the the, the skill set of a planner and most of the time you can see it within the contract. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Those are things that you need to pay close attention to. Most of the time, a person that's not really, that's just beginning their contract in some cases might be just one page. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I've sat back and watched this. And I think we talked about contracts last week mm -hmm. is that the contract kind of spells out the details and duties mm -hmm. of what the plan can do. And so when you read their contract, and it glisses something that if it doesn't list anything that you're expecting them to do, then that that's, that's a conversation that needs to be had. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, most, most professional planners um, will have the full rundown of everything that they are capable of doing or mm -hmm. will do for your, for your event. If you go through it and you don't see those details, don't, my thing is I always tell people never make an assumption. So that's like, correct. When you when like so for your contract for planning, um, what what type of things change the price for the planning side of things? Is it pretty much the standard? It's the standard price. What what the only thing? What 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 affects the price? Is it the like I know some things it could be the distance, it could be location, but what other things could affect the cost for an event planner? Um, time frame is a big thing. If if you're a last minute person. That, that requires a whole lot of rush on my end or on the planner's end. Um, that can be, that can affect your pricing. Um, duties. If you're, if, if the standard duty is, okay, I help you find your venues and your vendors. Um, I schedule your meetings. Um, but let's say you want us to do your invitations. So that's a design fee for the invitations. That's a printing cost for the invitations. Then you have the, the there's time that, you know, putting the, the invitations together, the postage for the invitation, like those kind of things can add, can add on to your cost. But those are some things that a lot of times planners actually will do or will add into their base contract that they will help you out with invitations. Because a lot of times brides and grooms, they don't know how to do all that stuff, putting it together. They know what they like and they don't know what they don't like. Right. You know what I mean? So sometimes we have to, we end up doing those types of things that can add to your cost. Of course, travel. Um, if I'm going to be more than 30 miles outside of my office, um, then that's a travel fee. Um, that can also entail if I'm going from here to, let's say, Richmond, Virginia for a wedding, that's um, overnight accommodations can go into that as well. So there's different things that come up along the way. And so, like, one of the things that people need to take in consideration is when you hire a planner or event coordinator, you have to understand the, the location piece because that is, I think that's across the board for all vendors, is you got to pay that travel fee. That's um, right. Most of the time, I think, like, I haven't, I haven't checked the IRS right now, but I think it was 56 cents a mile. And then, like, in some cases, some, some planners and event coordinators charge per diem. That's um, correct. So those are things... And, and again, if they have a team, you're paying per diem for that team um, because most of the time, depends on how big the wedding is, is how that bases on the team. So that kind of like goes into like if you have a large wedding, that means you have, a, have to have a large team. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I try to explain to people that the bigger the wedding, the more the cost. You need okay. at least one, one um, assistant per, per 50 people. Okay. And I know that sounds crazy, but listen, when people are coming into the wedding, that's pretty much a streamlined kind of thing. We kind of streamline that. It's the reception 
that really gives us the most labor intensive stuff. We're going to, um, sometimes the catering company may not have servers. So my team ends up serving elder, you know, elderly at the the reception. Um, Sometimes they're, um, there are those that need help getting here and there. It's just it, really, I try to base it on every 50 people. We need another person. I need another right. one of my team members. Now we could probably go 75 per one, but I try to try to keep it at 50, one per 50. And then like, how much does it like for assistant? What's the normal rate for an assistant? Like if you have to add assistance, let's say $25 if you have to, like, an hour. 25 and that kind of that can that's mm-hmm. what I was trying to tell someone between most cases going to be anywhere between 15 to 25 dollars an hour mm-hmm. based on the type of I should say the level of um of where that that company is at in their planning because I've most most companies that are well established they're charging 25 dollars an hour mm-hmm. so and that's not I'm charging you and paying them 10 that's literally what we're paying the assistance right. for the day I mean, you know, per, per hour for the day. You don't, you don't make a profit off of them. They just pretty much, that's what they're, they're just, it's automatically like you're paying them per, for being there. That's correct. Okay. Now to flip the script. So like planning is only but so many things that can cause effect to change, like changing the price. Um, but when it comes to decorating, decorating is primarily based on the vision and the amount of people. Why is that? Well, you got to think about it. Um, If you're throwing a reception for 80 people, I'm just going to use that number 80, that's 10 tables. If the tables seat eight people per table, that, and that's not even including your bridal party. This is just your guest count. So right. that's that's 80 people. That's eight. Uh, that's 10 tables. That's 10 tablecloths, overlays or runners, um, chargers, napkins, napkin rings, glasses, be it the um, water goblets, Champagne toasted flutes, wine glasses, um, centerpieces, that's 10 centerpieces, um, chair covers, bands or sashes, all of those things add up. And it's based on your people because whatever I charge for 80 people is definitely not the same thing I charge for 200 people. Right. Because 200 people, we're talking 25 tables. Which that means more more things. That Maybe happen. more. And, that's and more that also than... means more staff. That has right. to be there to help to, to actually get everything set up. So, like a common, like full, like a full route. Let's say if someone wanted the full works on a one take on one table, one table cost can go anywhere between um, technically what between one hundred to one seventy five per table. Mm, I would say more along the lines of a hundred to maybe three hundred twenty five dollars per table because some people want these huge centerpieces. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So right. to give you a point, I know it's a broad range and I apologize for that, but it really depends on the taste of the client and what their vision really is for their event. But centerpieces can get very pricey. Right. So if someone was just trying to do something basic. Um, I wouldn't they're, say they're, basic. I'd say more simple. Right. Well, well, simple, <laughs> but yeah. Um, if it's more, more on simple. that, on those, on that course line, Kind of like they need to prepare for, like I would say, if they're doing 100 people, a budget of 3,000 is is kind of like a a starting number. Yes, it would be a very good starting number. 3,000 would be a good starting number for a budget for for decor for 100 people, um, mm-hmm. and then from there, if they have different types of, um, if they say <clears throat> if their vision is a little bit more detailed, then I guess it would cost a little bit more money than that. And it also depends on what type of, um, not only the centerpieces, but let's say the fabric for the tables, the tablecloths. There are some, like you can do basic, um, and I'm using the word basic this time, but basic polyester tablecloths, which is fine. But then some people may want rosette. Some people may want sequins. Some people may want um, uh, pinched taffeta. It, it just kind of depends. So that, that the type of, um, just the base tablecloth, can go from a very basic price up through the roof. It really just kind of depends on that, you know, that client and their taste. So um, the type of table all the components on the table affect your price. And um, my thing is, I was going to say is just because, like, and this is one of the biggest things, if a person decides to go out and purchase all the, and this is 
this is one of the biggest things that a lot of clients make a mistake at is when they go out and they purchase their own decor. Is that an easy way of doing things or is that a diff- difficult? What what explain to me how do you deal with a situation where a customer wants to go out and purchase their own own stuff? Well, it's kind of hard to tell people how to spend their money, but um my my always question is what are you going to do with it afterwards? Not everybody goes on to these different sites and buys the second hand or what they can consider second hand stuff and a lot of times people want the money they spent if i spent fifty dollars on this this one centerpiece item i'm on fifty dollars back it's that's not how it's going to work so well, I think like, in, as far as like a company's name um yeah, let's say for example they go to one of these like um let's say they go on amazon and mm-hmm. they buy these real cheap tablecloths um that you can see through as soon as light hits them yeah right Mm-hmm. So, how do you feel about using those? Because does, doesn't that reflect your your company's it reputation? It does, I, and I don't like it. Um, I will, and and I lo- usually if people have told me they purchase stuff, I try to sit down and meet with them so I can see the items face to face. Um, and I'll re- make recommendations um on what they can possibly do with them. Um, uh, there have been times I've actually pulled out my own tablecloths to go up underneath them. To block the light because these tablecloths are they're cheap in price and they're cheap in quality. And well, do you charge them extra? But do huh? you charge them extra because you're using your material to make um, up for their shortfalls for the material that they purchase? That is what we're supposed to do. I'll be honest, there have been times I have not charged somebody for it because honestly, my name, the, the name of my company, our reputation, the quality of the stuff that we bring makes more makes I guess it's a bigger thing for me because um if Somebody posts that picture and they tag Young and Lovely, and you can see straight through that tablecloth. They're gonna think Young and Lovely got cheap tablecloth. Right. So if I put something underneath it so it doesn't, you know, say bleed through, so to speak, with the light, and somebody posts a picture, I have a better chance of it not looking reflecting bad back on us. And so the other question actually makes my work harder and doubles my work, but that's just the truth of it. It's just I get people can get understanding. Uh, is like what they see on Amazon and where like the company you get your equipment from is a different quality. And Very a lot of people that. don't understand that because on Amazon, the pictures make it look like it's the perfect thing. But when you time to use it, it doesn't turn out to be as perfect. And so what people will, what, what I've what I've learned over the years is a customer will, will compare prices of what they want and those prices do not reflect what what's actually going to be used. How do y'all? How do you kind of discuss that with a customer so they understand it? Because like, let's say for a customer comes up, and I know there's tablecloths out there that that rent for anywhere between fifteen to twenty five dollars per tablecloth, mm-hmm. and then they go online they see the tablecloth is worth the same price that they rented. it. Um, how do you justify your pricing? Well, basically. Um... When you order that tablecloth and you get it in, you have to double check it because sometimes a lot of st- some stuff can come in with stains already on it. Believe it or not, I've, I've seen it happen a few times. Um, we have to prep that linen. Nine times out of ten, we usually wash them first. Then they have to be pressed. And trust me, Mari and I both know it takes over an hour to press a certain mm-hmm. size tablecloth. <laughs> um, yeah. Just in itself. And if you don't press them and you do wash them, you take them to the laundromat. Um, or a, a dry cleaners that will actually press them. The dry cleaners are charging us the arm and leg for that. Right. Literally to actually press them and get them nice and neat for that. Then you're talking about the labor, putting them on the tables, my team members that are putting them on the tables and dressing the tables. Then they got to come back off. And guess what? That process to start all over again. Laundry being pressed and prepped and all that. It's a, it's a process. So the clients much, aren't going to do all that. They go over the much, and throw it on the table. So it's pretty much the and process. It's going to process. Have it's kind of like you're getting a better product because it's being properly prepared versus right. you go to the store and just purchase it and just throw it on the table. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what what could um what could a customer do to find the right decorator? What what type of thing? Because right now we know there is no regulation to say hey or nay on a, on an actual decorator. Technically, anyone can just, hey, decide to go buy some tablecloths, chair covers, and call themselves a decorator. So what can, what, like, 
what's kind of like what can a customer do to to check the reputation of a decorator because then the key thing the reason why i say that is because decorate decorators are very non um let me see they're kind of like non marketing um they're not in the marketing of advertising themselves most of the time are more reserved so there you can't go do any reviews you can't check their reviews um you can't do because a lot of them are not out there on social media or they don't have the proper marketing um to establishments for a customer to go and review their work so what what can be done for a customer to what type of homework should a customer do before they hire a decorator as for references as for examples of their previous work and not just a picture let me tell you something you can go on the internet and snatch any picture you want to snatch okay right. what you want to do is you want to see an actual event that they've done meaning in eight to ten pictures you can see that's the exact same event you know what i'm saying right. um one thing i i have a bad habit of not doing which i should probably do better at is that i don't take a lot of pictures with me in the the actual setup and but i think that most planners most i'm sorry most decorators really should probably do that to show that they that is their event um get somebody to take a picture of you with your event behind you so that people know that it's actually your event um but check behind them um ask for photos and i mean like complete event photos um definitely uh, reach out to them about possible references i mean because i mean i guess anybody could say well Oh, this is my best friend, so and so. So write write this reference for me, or whatever, or tell this person this right here. But if you can see the the work itself, and also ask them about venues that they worked in, because venues will tell you about the decorators. Believe it or not, if you ask someone in the venue, "Hey, I was looking at hiring X Y Z company to decorate my wedding." What I see that they're on your list. What did you guys think of them? Or I see that I seen a few pictures that. Um, they have done some events here at your venue. What did you think of their work here? Like, do some research. Don't just go, um, and let me say this. I don't want to be mean when I say this, but don't get starry-eyed because somebody could talk a good game, honestly, and you just jumping out there to jump on it. No. Give it a second. Do a little bit of research, and you might come out with a better situation. Right. And so, like, and I, I, I always say this: people have to understand there's a different level of decor mm -hmm. when you're doing a church event mm. versus a wedding. Mm -hmm. And this is the most common issues I've seen in ten years: is just because a person can coordinate a church event doesn't mean they can sit back and now. Don't get me wrong; sometimes they can. But it doesn't mean they can coordinate a wedding. Now, but, again, not I, but the yeah. thing is that they automatically, people automatically think because they can do that, they can do this. Don't assume. You just made right. that statement earlier. Don't make assumptions. Right. Never make assumptions on yeah, it. And that's, and. Exactly, and that's the most common, that is always the most common issues that we see um, across the board is just because they can do it in one setting doesn't mean they can do it in another setting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think say if it's a simple, so like I said, I, we're going to use the word simple versus basic. If it's a simple setup, then it's not an issue. But when it becomes complicated, like, for example, what, what do you do when you have someone, let's say they come in and they want a Beauty and the Beast um, wedding theme or a Star Wars wedding theme or no, some of the stuff that's a little extreme. I call them more non-traditional type weddings. Mm -hmm. what what type of like that that decor if they have to if you have to go out and purchase something does it is, is it going to cost the customer more money that would depend <clears throat> on what it is like okay for instance um in our package place settings is an is included so even if you do a beauty and the beast and we're gonna pretend like i don't have those two boxes of all that stuff but um when i first did a beauty and the beast um type event i literally went to different little stores all over three cities, I think it was, to accumulate place settings, which was a dinner plate, the dessert plate, you know, all that stuff, trying to get everything together so I could have these different really pretty place settings. Well, um, people 
clients are not going to know that that's what I'm running around to do or that that's, that's what I had to do. So they're not going to understand the gas that I had to spend, the time I had to spend, things of that nature. But if it's if I don't normally include place settings, then yeah, there would be an extra charge for rental. You can't charge somebody if the, the place settings cost me, I don't know, $5 a place setting and they're doing a wedding for 100 people. I can't technically, I guess you can, but technically you're really not supposed to charge them what it costs you to buy the stuff. You're supposed to charge them what it costs to rent it from you. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. So I think what, what happens a lot of times is those that don't have the equipment um, or the, the correct inventory, they would charge the customer the full price of the item. Well, if you're going to charge them full price, give it to them. Right. Now, if it's something like um, you're wanting me to pipe and drape an entire venue, that's not in my normal package. So th that's going to cost you more money. But right. not because I got to go out and buy it. It's because I've got to bring in a team to set it up. Right. For a whole building. It could, could be 200 plus feet. That's why it's kind of important that if they if they find the right venue, that might that means in most cases, if it, it matches their vision, that's, that's right. less money that they have to spend on decor or spending like they don't have to do pipe and drape. And that most time, and I would say this is that when a person finds a building, if you have to pipe and drape that venue, in most cases, you chose the wrong venue. Or or they looked at the price of the building versus the price of the one that they that really they really wanted or what really fit their right. their idea and not realizing that because you didn't pick the right place, you're actually going to end up spending that amount of money, if not more, because now you're having a pipe and drape. Like I have a quote I just did for um 200 240 feet or 220 feet of pipe and drape i think it was no 320 feet it was gonna run over three thousand four thousand dollars for the oh. pipe and the drape seriously because just of the a, just the pipe and drape of venue right you know what i'm saying and it can be very pricey that's pretty much one of my regular package prices you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But because they chose a different a, um, a venue that had a cheaper price tag from the, from the start, not looking at the long term or how you're going to end up spending that money in the long run anyway, they could have came out much cheaper just getting the right venue from the beginning. Well, that's And I think that's the biggest piece is like if you're concerned about the price of the venue, then you need to understand that when you go with a lower cost venue, understand the work how much money you're going to spend on the decor side and i think that's the biggest piece mm -hmm. is like that's why i would tell most of my clients go with a venue that has um plain walls they don't have a lot of stuff on the walls um that the building is more plain because then it's a little bit it doesn't spend a lot more money versus you go to like a, a vfw for example or mm -hmm. some of these places where are like a shrine type club where they have stuff hanging all on the walls mm -hmm. and you don't want their trophies or their things to be seen. So now you have to spend all this money on pipe and drape to hide it. And um, though you paid a lesser price for the place, you still end up spending the same money, if not more, because you're having to do more stuff. Are we allowed to say the name of a couple of venues? If yeah, we say sure. something positive? Okay. So I was thinking when you were talking about venues that you don't have to do a lot to. Okay. Right? There was an, um, when we did the Sweet 16 um, back in December in New York, when we were um, talking about, when Rose and I were talking about the um, venue, she was saying the place is so beautiful that you don't have to do much to it. And she was absolutely right. We didn't have to do much to it. And then there's a place in, um, a name's place in North Carolina, in um, the Fayetteville area, there's Catlett Farm. Right. That it, it has its own style. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. But the venue is so adorable. There's not that much you have to do to it. You know what I'm like, saying? For, like Fiskaya Villa is another Yeah, like Fiskaya Villa. Fiskaya Villa, um, Skyview. Um, they have their own They have their own look, but their right. look are so nice that you don't have to do a whole lot to them. Right. And you most, tables and, and chairs. You got to dress the wall. I mean, most of the time, and I'll say this, is that most venues that are designed for <clears throat> wedding, like you said, you have, um, we, we see you have the Intrigue, 
You have the uh, Carolina mm -hmm. Barnes. And you Intrigue have, is a really good one. Right. You, you got have two uh, different buildings there. You know what I'm right. saying? Because there's and then the thing is, is the, the, the way things are designed, there is empty. So it's like um, it's it's more of a they don't have a, a lot of extra stuff that you have to hide. So like mm -hmm. of course their cost the cost of those facilities are anywhere between one thousand to three thousand dollars, but it's mm -hmm. or in some cases four thousand. Um, because Carolina Barnes, of course, is a little more expensive. But if you mm -hmm. go to those type of places, you look even studio two fifteen, um, mm -hmm. there's a special look. So, like when you go to these venues, it fits your vision, so you don't have to spend a lot of money on decor. Mm -hmm. um, but when you have to go to places like um, the Hope Mill Shrine, now the Hope Mill Shrine is a good location because of how many people it can hold, and it has yeah. a full phone, like it has a full blown kitchen and um, a huge parking area. Right, a, a whole private parking area, but mm -hmm. because of all the things on the walls, um, some I've seen in the past, some customers. Um, don't want that to be their backdrop of their event or their wedding. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people pipe and drape those things, which again becomes very pricey. Um, and, and I think that's where you have to find your balance mm -hmm. in between them. And then, like, let's list the biggest factor, um, which I was going to say this one for last because we're going to talk about the interaction with the venue is time. Um, for for a coordinator slash decorator, even for a court for more so for the decorator. It's critical that you establish your vision, hire your decorator in advance, at least six months or early, or six months or more, um, six months to 12 months in advance, because you want to give them the time to make sure that they have all the right stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Once you get within six months, is that kind of like the red zone for a decorator? Mm, it can depend. What's three the red zone? Like, what's the red zone? Scary. Say My red zone is three months or less. That's that's a scary zone for me. Okay. Because um limitations can come up. Like if they want the throne chairs or they want um one of our specialty tables, they may have already been rented out. Even if it's an event I'm not actually doing, it may my rental equipment may already be promised somewhere else. Um, so to me, three months or less is scary. Six months is a little bit more com like more wiggle room for me. Um six months or more is great um but the thing is is that you're looking at um floor if, if, if you need if you need flowers um ordering those things in if they're live flowers getting if they're in season at the time of year that your event is taking place um there's so many different little aspects that go to putting it together and it really depends on that person's vision for their event um because it can it can get scary it can get scary for us. Um, right. We'll never let you see a sweat, so to speak, but it can get scary for us and we can get a little panicked on our end, like, oh my God, am I going to be able to make this work? You know what I'm saying? But, um, and I, to this day, I tell people all the time, I still get nervous the week of an, an event. I'm still nervous. And I've been doing this for almost 25 years. I still get nervous. I'm double checking myself, triple checking. Right. Do I have this? Do I have that? Do, is this a place? Is that, like, I'm literally that person. Well, you want to say my thing is one of the things I always tell my clients is I prefer to be uncomfortable versus comfortable because when you're uncomfortable, you won't make a mistake mm -hmm. to a degree. When you're comfortable, that's when you start to overlook things you and you start love. making mistakes. Right. You will love. And that's the, one of the things you just said that that's a, I want people to understand is that a decorator and a florist are two different things. Mm -hmm. So when, the, um, when we talk about that, um, please explain to them why why a decorator and a florist are two different things. Okay, so most decorators do the stuff. I'm sorry, y'all. My phones are going crazy right now. Um, most decorators will do like your rentals, your table linens, your chair covers. Um, they'll come up with a concept for different things. They'll they'll pipe and drip your room. They'll provide you with certain rental items like thrown to your love seats or custom tables, things of that nature. Um, but not all decorators work with flowers. Some of them know how to do them. Some of them don't. And um, a florist literally is exactly what it sounds like. That is someone who can build you floral pieces, meaning your body flowers, your boutonnieres. Uh, that would be your bouquets and boutonnieres and corsages. Someone who can actually 
build your centerpiece is someone who can do, let's say you want to do one of those um, really nice uh, circle backdrops or even a, a pipe and drape backdrop and you want flowers on it, a florist can provide you with those types of decor items. Not every decorator can do that. Like I don't own a, a you know, floral shop, but I do know where I can purchase wholesale flowers and I do know how to put them together, but that's not everybody's thing. And there's certain things that I may not do the way an actual florist would do. And you are going to pay for their services because they're, you're paying. Here's the thing. Price comes in play with a lot of people. And the first thing you want to go is, well, I don't have to, why do I have to pay that much? You're not paying. It's just one day. Uh, it's, you know, all this other stuff. Listen, you're paying for the services for that day. Yes. But you're paying for their experience, their knowledge, their education, their history, their, their work their labor, you're, it's a lot of stuff that you're paying for for that day because their work didn't start the morning of your event. Their right. work started way before your event. And I think people fail to understand that. The average wedding, I'm going to say this, the average wedding planner can put 75 to 100 hours minimum in on a wedding. And if you're only paying them $3,000, it's not a lot of money. Okay. You know what I'm saying? But they look at just the, the bulk. They don't look at the bigger picture. You know what? Like right now, I'm really, really close to the thing. But you got to look at the bigger picture of things. And I think that's where the price thing comes into play so much. And it becomes like a, almost like a tug of war, you know? Right. And, and I say this all the time. When you go to these restaurants, you're not arguing them down about their prices. When you go to buy your car, they might have a sale going on. That'd be great. But the manufacturers say that what they want for their car. Right. When you go in there to buy it. So uh. when you come to us for our services, why was, must we always have to negotiate? Well, I think the biggest, them? I think what the misleading portion of it is <clears throat> if they, and this is, this is a, this is one of those things that I kind of like sometimes social media can be the, it can be the downfall of why, cost is the way it is or why, why people think the cost is less is mm -hmm. they'll go and look at something and think that oh okay wow like for example like in most cases now most dollar trees um oh stop well, it I'm, I'm stop just gonna say it. <laughs> you're not about to get up and walk away right now right because like, what what was what what, what what and this is where the mishap happens at is you walk into a dollar tree most dollar trees like say <clears throat> here the one on bragg boulevard is the perfect one to explain because it has a section dedicated just for weddings and events and what a person will do is they'll see these items in the dollar tree and then wonder why they are being charged more but it's not the same items um and i think that's where miss people people who don't understand that the decor industry don't understand that that cost is more than a dollar 25. so like for example i was telling someone before Okay, you go look at a charger. <clears throat> a charger from Dollar Tree will cost you a dollar twenty-five mm -hmm. for a charger. Um, but if you go and you get a charger that won't break, that's a little bit more stronger, more sturdier, and has a more um, better look to it, you're going to charge. It's like the charger costs maybe two ninety-nine to three dollars. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have to understand there's a difference. Um, it's just like you can, like for example, you can buy. A pair of a pair of jeans, one place, and then go somewhere else. The jeans are more expensive because of the quality of how it's designed, how it's made. So a lot of people, it's a, it's a misinterpretation because they might see something one place, but yet they don't understand where, 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 where the inventory that you like. If you're a professional decorator, your inventory is going to come from a different place, and it's not going to be the Dollar Tree. Mm -hmm. So you do have some decorators. That will purchase stuff from the Dollar Tree based on the customer's budget, <clears throat> but there's a big difference on those two, and I think that's where yeah, the yeah. misinterpretation comes in on the pricing is because just because you see it um, at the Dollar Tree doesn't mean that this, the cost, the actual service, or the the, um, the rental should be cheaper. Here's the thing: you can buy the. You can buy the, the Dollar Tree chargers. Um, as a decorator, you can buy the Dollar Tree chargers. 
but then um and and rent them to whomever for 50 cents a dollar whatever but at the end of the day customers need to understand that when those charges are taken off the off the table we have to literally um <clears throat> wash them you know they have to be stored they have to be packed up cleaned off at the venue um if we can't wash them at the venue then of course because time restraints or whatever then we got to leave there get them back to whatever storage place we have them be at the garage or a storage facility or a storefront they have to be washed and prepped and dried and all this stuff ready for the next time they have to be rented out like it's more to it than just oh it was a dollar no and in in my mind I, I think about all the other parts that go along with it do you know how heavy 45 charges are in a tote extremely heavy yes <laughs> okay do you know that i have, to lift, those, I have to lift those things because maybe yeah. my my guys are doing other stuff you know how yeah. heavy those pipe and drape poles can be mm-hmm I mean, this what? It's the labor that a lot of people don't understand that goes on behind it. Yeah, <clears> not just the it. item, but the labor that goes behind it. It and, is a lot. And, and trust me, my thing, back is starting to tell me it's a lot. I'm just saying yeah, it's a lot. That, that the abuse on your body, you know, you start to feel it. Oh my god! But they, so can, but people complain so quickly without right. looking at the bigger picture. Right. So like that's the one that worries me. And I think that's one of the things I wanted to highlight when I was talking about the floors. Um, the people have to understand that when you go with live flowers, it's going to cost you more money. No, not necessarily. Seriously. Not really? necessarily. Really. Think about this. Um, I'm going to give you an example. If you go into Hobby Lobby today, so I don't think they're having a flower sale this week. Go into Hobby Lobby today. And pick up a hydrangea stem. If you know, if anybody knows what hydrangea is, it's, it's a really nice fat head flower. Pick up a hydrangea stem. The cheap looking ones are about $4.99 a stem. The really nice high quality ones run up between $8.99 and $14 to $15 per stem. But I can go purchase live ones for less than $3 a stem. Okay. <clears throat> Well, let me, let, me, the type let, me, of flower. let me retract. It's easier to deal with non-live flowers. There you go. Okay. That's what mm -hmm. technically when I said cost, I was really talking about um, you still have to, like, for example, you have time. to have, you have to spend a lot more time organizing mm -hmm. when to, when to put them out versus mm -hmm. when you're dealing with flowers that are not real, mm -hmm. you can just put them out at any given time. Mm -hmm. um, where like I, I have one wedding <clears throat> where they put all the live flowers and almost all of them were dead before the wedding can start. And it was because the venue had heat, had air problems. So it was hot and, mm -hmm. and the, the flowers didn't make it. So it's kind of like, well, kill some live was in a heartbeat. Right. Which brings me to my last thing that we're going to discuss is the venue. Mm -hmm. How critical <clears throat> is it to get a venue that meets all requirements for a decorator? And when you say meets all requirements for a decorator. Time. Our biggest enemy is time. Um, to be honest with you, when you're setting up an event, um, ven venues can be so, whew, let me see how to say this a nice way. No, venues can be money hungry. They can nickel and dime you to death. They'll only give you X amount of hours. Oh, well, if you need extra time, it's, this amount of money per hour, right. you know, and right. there are some that there are some that were, are totally vin, vendor friendly. There is in particular, I can name Catlin Farm again because they let us, they got, let us get in on Friday, start our setup on Friday and finish our setup Saturday morning. You know what I'm saying? Right. Just, just to use them as an example. There are some venues out there that will allow you to do that because they understand that these designs take time. Every single bride and groom does not want the same exact wedding. That's going to take me exactly two hours and 47 minutes to set up. Right. And Every single client is not the same. So when venues recognize that every person is different and they allow for more time for your vendors to get in and do the decor, like I hate it if a client's paid for um, certain decor and then I can't get it done because we're we're restrained by time. The venue ain't got to worry about that. I do. Right. 
or any other decorator. We have to worry about that if things are not done. To, and, and there can be as much prep work as possible and you still might run into a hiccup right. or two that day and something may not get done. But the client is not looking at the venue saying, well, you didn't give them enough time. They're looking at you, us saying, well, why not get this? So what would be your recommendation? Um, like, Because like, one thing is I tell my customers all the time, um, when you get a venue and if it's a wedding, it's better to go with the package deal versus the hourly rate. That's correct. Um, because the package deal normally accommodates all the time that we need to set up for a wedding. Um, what what other things, if, if like, let's say if you come across a venue that does an hourly rate, what would be the recommended time that you would, I mean, just to, for a simple wedding setup, what would be the bare minimum time that's required um, for a setup for someone who's doing decorations for 100 people? Our, requ our requirement is four hours minimum. Okay. That's our requirement. I mean, some people can maybe do it, do it a little bit differently. Um, but for something like that, I require at least four hours. And because you got to think about it. I was just talking to one of my <laughs> planner friends last night. Uh, Tavi, I hope she's watching this. Um, we we're talking about how we could take 30 to 45 minutes just to unload. Right, right. Let alone get in the building. So if you tell me I can't get into 10 o'clock, I might need to be there at 9.15 or 9 o'clock just to unload. So we, Now, mind you, that's that's double the work. We're putting our hands on it twice. Right. You get it off the trailer or off the truck and get it in front of the door waiting on you to get there. Then we got to take it inside the building. But it's, again, um, when venues put restraints on us, or you know, shackle us that way, then we're 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 kind of like forced to just try to come with any concept we can to get everything done in that time frame that we're given. And that's exactly. all we have to work with. And now for for setup time, it might take four, but for breakdown time, how many hours would it take? Maybe two. Okay. So that's that would be all your vendors. Right. That four hour span allows your caterer to set up, your DJ right. to set up, your videographers. It that four hours covers everybody. And that's why I always recommend the bare minimum that you get a 10 hour package mm -hmm. um, because a 10 hour package normally would cover a, a simple setup. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to do something a little more, um, I guess a little bit more outside of ordinary, ordinary um, mm -hmm. then you really are going to really face a time crunch. And I think that's where time management comes into place with a lot, a lot of venues that recognize this. Um, they automatically understand and they'll work with vendors, mm -hmm. but that's that's just one of the biggest pieces. So, for a venue, it's also hard to get venues that will actually mm, that actually understand what we're doing, and 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 respect the the um, integrity of the clients. But what? Oh, you're breaking up. Uh oh. Right here at the end. Hello. Tish, if you're still there, check your settings. While waiting on Tish to jump back in, um, what the big, biggest piece that we're discussing right now is that the time needed, um, and it's important that that you do get a venue that at least um right gives your the decorator enough time so when you hire the venue you really want to get that decor um you really want to talk to your decorator make sure that they he or she has enough time to set up everything are you back with us Tish? there we go you came back in you yeah, dropped off for a quick second uh oh there you go oh your microphone's muted my bad sorry it keeps dropping oh, okay now we're almost done. Um, so I was just covering covering down for what you what we were just discussing. So overall, um, we just kind of like discover what we just kind of covered in detail was the breakdown on the on what causes the price to change um for decorators, excuse me, wedding coordinators and decorators. And so Tish, um Tish, she's pretty much she's um she's an expert in both levels. Um so she pretty much does. She was able to speak in detail in reference to the cost effective piece of why things cost as much. And then like like and this one last thing before we get out of here is in a situation where your time gets cut in half, if you have to do two hours or more, like say if the customer doesn't give you the time 
then of course the cost for the door decoration is going to go up because you have to hire more people that's to come right. in a shorter period that's and correct. that's just what people to understand is that you're going to pay the cost one way or the other um so if you don't pay for the extra time then you're going to pay for the labor to, to do it within that short period of time yeah so that's that's very very true because what what might have been a, a six person setup might turn into a 12 person setup because i don't have enough time right all right yeah, so like a 25 an hour thing <laughs> that, exactly that that's where you, you have to pay a lot more money out for labor um and that's i try to get people to understand is time having the appropriate time will save you money um mm -hmm. in the long run because like you think about it you pay that 100 dollars, 200 dollars for the extra one or two hours versus you have to hire six more people that's 150 dollars. so you know and then that's only like that's 150 times two that's like 300 dollars more you have to spend on labors if it's only four people but if you have to spend more money out there on six people that's 100 like 150 dollars per person or should say 150 dollars per hour so you're still going to pay that money one way or the other yep so it's better to do it the right way than have to do it to where it requires a lot more people all right well tish tish you have any other thing you want to say before we get out of here no um well actually yeah uh everyone that's out there that is um planning a wedding working on a wedding looking to um put together their wedding listen take a deep breath do some research check these venues out before you book with them um read your contracts i'm gonna say that at the end of every time i'm on this show read your contracts make sure you understand the parameters of what you're signing before you sign it that yeah. way you know exactly what you're getting and then know exactly what you're expecting them expecting from them okay but that's it everybody have a great friday and my last thing is I always say never make any assumptions always ask questions i don't care how simple yeah. the question may seem always ask your vendors your venue questions because you will solve most of your problems by asking questions versus making assumptions there you go all right. Well, look, y'all, ladies and gentlemen, I hope y'all enjoyed the show. Um, enjoy your weekend. It's Friday. It's party time. So, hey, we'll see y'all next time. And then, like I said, we'll come back and we'll kind of highlight some more things. Um, I know with um, Tisha, we're going to try to work it out to where myself, Tisha, and then um, we have another person, Leah Smith, um, that we're trying to get to where we, we put out information about the planning side and the core side of things and then also get some insights in reference to um, some other things that go on when you're prepping things for, for events and weddings. Mm -hmm. All right. So y'all take it easy. Enjoy y'all weekend. And we'll see y'all later. Uh, for those that are tuning in right, later right. on, um, we do have our, our DJ show tonight at six o'clock. So um, for those coming back to see what's going on, on the DJ side, we'll see y'all at six tonight. Peace. Y'all take it easy. Bye.